Okay, so Saleh, uh, Ajal was a reference back in the day when you opened in 1991, and now already the Saleh Barakat Gallery is getting this recognition for its space and its where it's set, the landmark that this here at Clemenceau is represents. What what is your take here? In in fact, actually, after 25 years of career in Ajal, where uh, we try to defend through Ajal uh, the, what we can do about uh, the art, the art scene in, in, in Lebanon and the region, it was a normal evolution, an organic one, to be able to expand into a bigger space. Ajal is a great space, but it had its limitation in terms of size and height and location, of course, in the middle of the busiest uh, part of town. So uh, when this Masrah al-Madina, or the former Cinema Clemenceau, which is a landmark, a cultural landmark for the city of Beirut, Cinema Clemenceau, when it opened in 1964, it was where the first probably cinema of Are Ese in, in, in the whole Middle East. It's where the first Tarkovskis were shown outside the Soviet Union, the first Antonioni's, Bergman, Fellini's, Costa Gavras were shown in Beirut. And then in the 2000s, it was converted into the big theater of the city, Masrah Medina, which moved later on to, to Hamra uh, and leaving the space vacant. So for me, it, it was a great location closer to the new downtown. But at the same time, it gave us the space, a huge space, and especially the height, which is absolutely uh, fantastic for doing bigger exhibition. And through the 25 years of career, our, our stable of artists has grown in a way that we need today to do some retrospective, some major exhibitions that require unusual space, institutional exhibitions, let's say. So it came like a normal evolution that we need to have this bigger space that, with, uh, that will allow our program uh, uh, to reach its, its potential by having both spaces. Of course, we're keeping Ajial for the smaller exhibitions, and that will uh, give our institution uh, the potential to do much bigger shows. Uh, we, we put another name, I mean, we named it after uh, Saleh Barakat because we first we wanted to distinguish between the two entities because they are two different locations. Plus, uh, to a certain extent in, in those 25 years, I've become like a, an acknowledged person in the in the art of this part of the world, so it made a lot of sense to also acknowledge the name at the same time. And your artists have very powerful themes, like for example, here, uh, Ayman Baldaki's destruction of buildings of the uh, Beirut airport. What is that you look for then? In fact, the program in the first two years, which I planned, is to cover a different schools of art from the school of Beirut. I'm not necessarily only the world generation. I started with Nabil Nahas, who is a most confirmed, established artist who spends his time between New York and Beirut, and his work is about painting that goes from geometric to abstract to uh, figurative painting that are not necessarily related to any political uh, interpretation, but I moved, next exhibition is about Ayman, we'll go back to him, but then the third exhibition will be a retrospective for an artist who need to be rediscovered today, Jibran Tarazi, who has spent his entire life working on one geometric motif, an, an ancient Arabic archaic motif that he developed into a a kind of a contemporary up art coming from this region. And then it will be followed by a homage that we will be paying to the city of Beirut between 1960 and 1975 through the eyes of Waddah Faris. So as you can see, and then uh, uh, it goes on, we're doing another retrospective for a very avant-garde artist, Hamid Abdullah, 
then I mean, it's, it's a very long program that will be tackling different uh, uh, directions of what the art is doing in Beirut. Ayman is probably in the art that is related to the war generation, is probably one of the most prominent in emerging artists. And in fact, he is politically engaged. His the exhibition is about uh, like a, a, an address uh, regarding the, the establishment and the anti-establishment of the world today. Uh, Beirut is, because of globalization, is more heard today. There was always a very creative scene here, but that was more confined to, to Beirut because it, it was a little bit marginalized because of the war. But now, thanks to globalization and internet, you can do things in Beirut and be heard in Barcelona or Tokyo. Uh, so the message is about the failure of the state all around the world. People are feeling uh, today that the state that was supposed to defend their own interests has become a very heavy uh, machine, bureaucratic machine that is only serving itself. And therefore there is a need to do something. And so we, I wanted the second exhibition to show a little bit this political engagement in some of Beirut artists, not all of them are particularly engaged toward the war or the politics, but some of them are, and Ayman is probably one of those who are uh, most prominent in this direction. But I would like to uh, focus particularly that it is, although politics is very present in his work, it is only for me a reason to paint. At the end of the day, Ayman Balbaki, at least with my humble opinion, is a painter who is very, who is going to be very present in the history of art, because like in the 50s and the 60s, uh, uh, Pollock has gone from European figuration of Matisse and Picasso into what has been known as the American abstract expressionism. And in fact, Ayman, in the continuation of this tradition, is somehow taking American ab abstract or abstraction or the, the, the heritage of American abstract expression, expressionism taking this abstraction back towards a certain figuration. If you get close to any of Ayman's painting, it is very clearly an extremely abstract painting, and I hope you can show that in your film. But then you cannot at all think this is a figurative painting. It's absolutely abstract. But the minute you go very far from it and you look at the ensemble, you can see a figurative image. So for me, even on the painting technique side, he is a, an extremely interesting artist. Add to that, that his subject matters today are very in. And in fact, when he painted this, uh, these burnt flags, particularly this big British uh, Union Jack flag, it was no, nobody was predicting Brexit at that time, but it was obvious that uh, Ayman is very much involved into what's happening today in the world, and he feels this increasing uh, return to frontiers, to borders, to nationalism, to protectionism, and, and the way an engaged artist would look at that and denounce it through his critical thought. Okay, so Saleh, do you believe that nowadays here in Lebanon there is currently a cultural regeneration coming after this period uh, of 20 years that was the war? I'm not sure if the right word is to use the, the word regeneration because actually I think it was always there, it has always been there. But I think that 
today because of the new technologies of uh, transmitting things, the internet, the Facebook, uh, Instagram, whatever, the world has become much more communicative on that level. And so people are being able to follow what's happening in Beirut in a, in a better way. But uh, there is no doubt that if I want to compare between uh, 25 years ago and today, people have understood more and more that culture is not, or painting or art, is not only a kind of a decorative thing for the rich, bored people. No, it is an extremely contemporary way of expressing change and they know how valuable it is today, so we are witnessing more and more uh, institutions uh, in Beirut. So there are more museums, more art centers, more institutional collections that are giving the added value of art into what makes meaning for change in the whole society today. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, lately I read uh, in a catalog that it said about Ayman, but I think it can be said about the other artists that they use, as you were saying, art as a way to communicate, but also as a way to witness something that this memory that they have, e either of the war generation or, for example, Mohammed al Rawas from the power of women that you had. Do you, do you think that this is the... How would you define art in general? Okay, look, uh, on a spectrum, you know, any artwork has a, a, it goes from a very conceptual extreme to an extremely technical extreme, if you want, throughout history. In the Renaissance period, there was one patron, one client, the church, and it was asking all the artists to paint one subject, let's say, the Last Supper. So. The, the, the artists who need to paint the same subject practically, they had to distinguish themselves by their technical capacities. Okay? On the other extreme, in the early 20th century, uh, people were interested mostly in the con concepts behind the artwork. So there was pra practically no technique. It reached a place where there was no real artwork, but only ideas that are being conveyed. Um, and I think today the world is moving into something a little bit uh, more uh, in between, where you have an artist with a strong concept. So he is in interested or completely obsessed with a certain intellectual engagement. Uh, but at the same time, he is expressing it through a, a so, some sort of a know-how that is very unique to him. This is what makes it art and not only intellectual uh, uh, thought. Um, so this is where I think I'm, I'm particularly interested as a gallerist. My definition, there are many definitions of art in fact, but my definition is that there should be at least some sort of magic. Uh, the intellectual, conceptual part is extremely important because today we're not anymore impressed by a, a technicality that is not somehow stimulating or provocating your, your intellect. So it has to be based on a very strong, powerful intellectual concept. But then from here, which could be a book or also a piece of theater, I mean an idea, how can you convert it into art? That's where the, the definitions are different. But for me, at least, there should be some magic. Why the same idea I cannot, why with Ayman it is more powerful and I cannot do the same because there is something that is related to this particular artist that he can convey his emotions using some material or some uh, technique that are very special to him, that he developed and that transmit this kind of magic. So when you sit in front of it, you say, I cannot do it. It's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, wow.
you know, this wow effect. And where, where do you think that uh, with artists like Ayman Catanani, Katia Trabulsi, where do you think that the art scene now here in Lebanon is going thanks to these artists and, and you? It's, for me, it's a continuation of a, of, a, of a rich tradition where art has been really a part of the intellectual discourse of this society. And those are really uh, transmitting the relay in a very nice way. Plus, additionally, that we have to admit that this particular generation carries a certain memory of, uh, of the everything that this region is going through. We cannot forget or just try to imagine that being surrounded by, by this unbelievable amount of violence all the time, everywhere in this part of the world, that it does not affect people, and particularly artists who are not sensitive, who are more sensitive than other people. So there is a very strong uh, weight that this generation is carrying from the memory to their pursuit of how can one survive in such a hostile environment that they are being able to express through their art, which makes their art, in addition to its interest artistically, it becomes also a, a subject of uh, what we can call a primary source of information. You can, in 50 years, people can read the violence that this area was going through by simply looking at how those artists develop their techniques or material or ideas and how this trans was transmitted into art. Okay. Um, to finish, uh, do you... Uh, how, do you believe that uh, there's this there's like a mirror effect between what was Lebanon like before the war and how it's going to be now. Like if the war was just a transition, 16 year old transition that made it stop, but now it's going to some place near what it was before that. First, it did not stop. Art was still being produced during the war. And in fact, I curated an exhibition in 2009 at the Beirut Art Center called uh, 1975-1990 painting in times of war and in fact uh, it uh, surprised everybody by the, the amazing art that was produced during the war time. The thing is art that is produced under the bombs, under violence, under during the war is usually pretty aggressive and uh, you don't want to look at it during the war period. It's only at peace period when you start a little bit being critical about the former, the earlier periods and look at them and try to, to dis dissect what was happening. So, no, there was a continuation. But I cannot say that, you know, that we can say it's a reflection. Beirut before the war was a very unique place that was blending a little bit. Uh, uh, it was a platform where the East and the West were meeting during the Cold Wars. So we were open to the former Soviet Union because there were a lot of communists and leftists in Lebanon. At the same time, there was a lot of uh, uh, right-wingers who were very interested in uh, Western uh, politics. And there is all in the middle, the Arab world, all this were being, uh, I mean, uh, confronting itself in the city of Beirut in times where post-war, there was a, a hope, a great hope to build a new world. It was, uh, we were getting out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and most of the people of the 50s and the 60s were at least hopeful that we are building a new hopeful world. That, that was 
the period. Unfortunately, with the 80s, 90s, and a lot of deceptions, many wars, the, 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 everything that happened throughout the world made to, brought to a lot of deception. The generation, the post-war generation, I, I don't think they look at the future as being a hopeful place. It's, uh, we're surrounded by global warming, uh, pollution, uh, extreme corruption, uh, failure of democracy, the rising of fundamentalism everywhere in all its different aspects, whether religious or racial or whatever. So the new generation is tackling new issues differently. So uh, a reflection, no. But while the generation of the 50s to the 80s were very representative of their own time, which was an interesting time, but different time. The new generation is very interesting because it's reflecting its own time, which is a different time, and they are doing it greatly. So that's how I can make the relationship.